No doubt about it. Congrats uh, to him and Bolton Lacano. So far, the first two names mentioned for the WWE Hall of Fame. But, of course, as we were talking about WCW land, we got to go back in history and the topic at hand today, Wrestle War 1991, which was February 24th from Phoenix, Arizona at the Arizona Veterans Memorial Coliseum. The attendance over 6,800, not, not too shabby there. The tagline, we want you, and the pay-per-views buys were 160 k So not terrible there either for Wrestle War 91, which of course will feature a War Games match. What are your kind of memories of just 91 WCW? Because you're there, not really wrestling as much in 91, but you're there. Um, you're kind of with Oz a little bit as Kev with uh, Kevin Nash. 91 seemed to be a little bit of influx, like Flair's on his way out. It just, it, 91 felt like a weird year for WCW. Yeah, it was too. Uh, I don't see, or I don't remember, Kevin and I making a lot of, Spot show, uh, house shows, and you brought it up before he was Oz. I don't think he made many house shows as Oz, did he? Not, not that many, no. So, and you guys really—it looks like one tag match, losing to Brad Armstrong and Owen Hart in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, in uh, March of '91. So, not many for you and him, at least. Yeah, and I don't think he had many. It was, like you said, it was a transitional year, and it was really in flux. I mean, uh, that's when Herd was in solid, right? Yep. Uh, that's when uh, Rick and him were going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Yep. There was a lot of... Uh, unstableness in the company and uh, when the committee tried to put uh, put Hurd's ideas it was like pounding a square peg in a round hole it just didn't work you know what I mean it was and then it caused a lot of difficulties. There was a lot of infighting. It wasn't a good time. It, to me, it was probably one of the lowest times until they went out of business. Yeah, 91 just felt like a, a weird year. I kind of liked it in a weird way, and as a fan, I liked it. But it definitely, looking back, it's like, man, a lot of weird stuff was going on. Maybe Hurd on his way out, Flair's on his way out. Uh, just strange. What did you like about it? I don't know why. When I was a kid, I was just a big Sting fan. So I just okay. I, so I just kind of like whatever he was doing. Like he's feuding with Nikita. He's feuding with Rude. He's feuding with Luger a little bit eventually. So I kind of like well, whatever uh, Sting was doing. Oh, Abby and Cactus were interesting. But when you look back at it, it's like it's kind of a, a stranger. Like you bring in Stan Hansen randomly a few times. So I interesting but weird year for sure. Right, right. And uh, when they brought Hansen in, I don't think they presented him the right way. He had all that licorice in his mouth running down his chest. I mean, would that be the way to present Stan Hansen, the ass kicker? No. It was like everything they did was like in a mirror. It was reversed than what it should have been, right? Yep. Definitely. Yeah. And interesting here the main event so it's going to be war games with sting brian pillman and the steiner brothers against the four horsemen rick flair barry windham sid vicious and arn anderson is injured so they have larry zabisco as a replacement he's not a member of the horseman but he just brought in as a replacement for arn who was injured at the time do you remember arn being injured and out of this match oh yeah that's when uh i heard his neck It was getting progressively worse. Mm. Yeah. You like Zabisco as the replacement? Yeah, absolutely. The cruncher, if you will. Yeah, uh, Larry was the perfect fit to replace Arn. you got to remember, they were tag team partners for a while, right? Mm-hmm. He fit in with the horsemen. Better than anybody else, I think. 
as an outside identity. Yep. I think he did a. I think they did a great uh, justice to the horseman and to Arn too, because they got a very good worker to replace Arn, or at least did, did for Arn. Yeah, well, yeah, yep. Yeah. What did you think of um, Sid Vicious as a part of the Horsemen? I didn't really like Sid in that group. I like Sid by himself. It's no knock on Sid. I think he, Sid is was extremely, extremely. If they could have kept him on track, or they could have kept themselves on track with Sid. Sid could have been a one of the biggest draws of all times. What do you think held him back? You know, I've heard the story. We've all heard the story about the softball, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I never saw him play softball. I don't know if that's true. But if that was true, I mean, to put that above what he was given the talents to wrestle was a huge mistake on his spot. And it also started it to draw down the hill. Do you know what I mean? That people would pick up, oh, where's Sid? Even if he was hurt, they'd say, oh, he's off playing softball. You know, the perception. Yep. And it made people, I think, hesitant to give him the keys to the kingdom. Bad reputation to have. Yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, Flair, Barry, and Arn are awesome and typical horsemen. Do you think Sid is like a typical horseman, though? you think he really fit the no, group, per se? No, no, that's what I was saying. I didn't think he fit the group at all. I don't think he fit the group at all. He should have been off by himself. Is that one of those things where they pick him to be a part of the group, or is WCW picking him to be a part of the horsemen? I think with the horsemen... Rick and Arn had to say to who was a horse most of the times. Maybe not um, Paul Roma, per se. I was Maybe. just going to say, I wasn't going to say, but that's what I was thinking, too. Yeah, because it definitely seems like he wasn't a pick. Yeah, Dusty put him in there. Any particular reason why? Probably because Paul looked good. He was a solid worker, but he just didn't fit in that group. I think it was because the diff all these guys that were horsemen except for Rick came from the South. Roma's accent, you know, it just didn't fit. Yeah, it's strange. Strange pairing. He looked good. Looked like a million bucks. Just didn't work oh, with, yeah. with the group. Yeah. Good worker, too. Yeah, very good. Solid. That's what I said. Looked magnificent. But there was something there. It was like, you know, uh, in the hood, that he was not in the right gag. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. When you look at um, the Horseman, too, you think that, being the horseman, doing the horseman in 91 is a little passe because, you know, this is like the fifth incarnation of the group. It, it started six years ago. Do you think that, or five years ago, six years ago, whatever, do you think that it still should have been a thing? Like, should the horseman have still been going in 1991? Well, it should have been reconstructed. You know, they should have disbanded. They should have had a great storyline to disband and then maybe he'll start picking off the former horsemen you know and uh, jumpings and where they finally have to come back together you know, you could have done something that way. Yep. 
Now, as, as far as Wrestle War here, 91, we'll start off mentioning this dark match, which is a very interesting dark match here. It's only about a 7-minute, 30-second 30, 30 dark match, but it's Eddie Guerrero and Ultraman defeating Hoi Chol and Rudy Boy. Obviously, these, these are Mexican athletes. Um, did not air in the pay-per-view, of course, but interesting. Eddie Guerrero in 91 here. I know he, uh, sporadically he would have some appearances, and obviously that match against Terry Funk, which was televised a few years earlier, is something that was amazing because he was really putting Eddie over and making him look good. But in 91 here, was there ever a thought of bringing Eddie in? I know obviously he comes in four years later, but was that ever a thought here? I think it was banted about. I mean... Eddie was a magnificent performer. Wasn't he uh, working in Mexico at this time with Art Bar as the Los Gringos? Uh, that would be a little bit later, but yeah, he would be a big part of that. Yep. Uh, was Los that Gringos the same time? Locos. Uh, that the... little, that, it was a little bit later, I believe. I'm wondering if he started to work Mexico then. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. What I'm saying, was he working in Mexico when he was coming in doing shots for WCW? In 91, yeah, a little bit here and there. Okay. So maybe basically, that... basically, he was in CMLL, and then eventually, I think 92-ish, heads to uh, AAA, and then a little bit after that, he starts teaming up with Art Bar. Okay, so maybe that's why they didn't uh, go after him as... Hardly as they should have. Maybe he, not as polished either in, in the the early 90s as he would eventually become? Well, of course he wasn't as polished, but he was great. I mean, he's a Guerrero. I mean, they know how to work. He could work. You know, they were wrestling in their backyard. There was a ring in their backyard in El Paso. He was a f phenomenal performer. And at the end, he became one of the greatest performers of all times. No doubt. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting to think like when you look at some of these old results and stuff like, wow, Eddie Guerrero popping up on dark matches. Obviously, if you weren't in the arena, you probably didn't see it, but it's just interesting to go back and look and see, wow, he had several appearances for WWE while he was still on CMLL. Right. Right. And so, the, uh, sorry. I, I think we we're trying to, some of us saw the, advantage of having a relationship with a company in Mexico. Absolutely. Smart. Seems like uh, AEW right now is going to CMLL and away from AAA, which means obviously you can't have those guys in the same card at the same time. So I don't know if that's uh, smart or, or I don't know, maybe it is having the CMLL relationship rather than the AAA relationship. I don't know. I, I would think you'd rather have the AAA, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the plan is. You'd have to know what the plan is and why they chose that. I know New Japan Pro Wrestling has a relationship with CMLL, and I don't know if that has anything to do with it because obviously AEW has a relationship with New Japan. So I'm, I'm not 100% sure all the inner workings of why, but I noticed that all the AAA wrestlers are kind of pushed to the side a little bit here by AEW, even though they were a mainstay for a while, and now CMLL is all over AEW TV. Yeah, I mean, obviously they're trying to, you know, the forbidden door, they've opened it up. And obviously they're trying to connect the dots with all three of them, right? Yep. If uh, New Japan and AEW, well, would you go with tr AAA? I don't think so. If the other, if you you and the New Japan don't have a working relationship, right? Right. So, so as far as the show, the pay per view kicks off interestingly enough with a six man tag match for the WCW World Six Man Championships, which didn't really last that long, and really kind of a a strange gimmick anyway do you think that in 1991 they needed a six-man title i mean it was basically around from february to december the championships and it was held by basically four teams so do you think it's ne necessarily it needed a six-man title in 1991 
wasn't that for Dusty and the Road Warriors? This would be the the new version. So th- they, okay. they they disappeared for a while, and then in '91 they popped back up. But originally, yes, you're right. Originally, back yeah. in the '88 ish era, yep. Yeah, I just I, I mean I'm not a fan of that trio champion. You know, just I don't know. It's just, just weird because. Support. It just Sorry. seems like there's not enough talent on the roster to have like six man titles, you know? Right. Right. And it's not like you had all these factions either that, that needed to have or necessitated a, a six man championship either. Basically. So junkyard dog, Ricky Morton and Tommy rich win the, the new six man championship match at a house show versus buddy Lindell, Dutch Mantel and Dr. X, which was moon dog Rex under a hood. So it's nothing like there was just this big faction warfare and you needed six man tags. Right. Right. I mean, uh, well, it was one of those things that we look back now and we know the mistake, you know, it was, they were trying to cram, Sometimes they would try to make every match very important. And it doesn't separate the main event. If there's five championship matches on the card, do you think? Yep. So the mistake having a trio championship, I believe. So Ricky Morton, Tommy Rich, and Junkyard Dog defended the titles and defeated Big Cat and the State Patrol, which was Lieutenant James Earl Wright and Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker. The match actually went almost 10 minutes, so 10-minute opening tag. And it really, not that bad of a match, if you go back and watch. It's actually a pretty good match. Just weird. It's like, wow, you really need a six-man title? This match is almost like a Saturday night match, not a pay-per-view match to me. Right, right. And that's what was going on this time that's why i asked you how did you like 91 to me it was just turmoil that nothing influx, made sense yeah. nothing made sense so yep uh go ahead so basically like what's going on here in, in 91 is i don't know like, like trying stuff out maybe is that what it is like throw it at the wall see if it works yeah and i'm trying to remember how much pressure Jim Hurd was pushing on that committee because he was coming up with those goofy ideas, you know what I mean? And he was, uh, it was like, do you remember the time he wanted to get rid of uh, the Midnight Express? Yes. And the booking committee overruled him? I think because of that, there was a severe split and was built up to coming that was us against them. You know what I mean? Yep. So it was a very difficult time. So after that match, Alexandra York, of course, Terry Reynolds, but Alexandra York of the York Foundation comes out. She has her computer with her, and she says, my computer predicts matches, and her man, Terrence Taylor, a.k.a. Terry Taylor, would win his match before the 15-minute mark had elapsed on his match later on against Z-Man. So an interesting little thing, and almost a little tease at AI here, right? I mean, talk about artificial intelligence. She had it before anybody. Yeah, but I think that's... (laughs) To think that we were thinking about AI back then. Yeah, no way. Yeah, no way. There was no way. <laughs> Do you like that, or is that a little hokey? She's got the computer, and she's, you know, she's got the glasses, and she's saying how smart she is, and she's going to predict matches and stuff like that. Corny, no? Well, it's hokey now. Back then, it was, uh, you know, the business was in a. Uh, transition that like you said the flux they didn't know what they wanted they didn't know everybody had a job right there was a repo man a plumber uh whatever yep. right then we had fireman ship and uh the lumberjack and all that right it just was a different time and a different era it was like they were trying to throw everything against the wall and see what's stuck. So basically the York foundation is 
going to be able to predict matches and obviously draw a lot of heat because the, the crowd is not particularly happy with uh, you know that kind of stuff. Like, hey, we're, we're predicting we're going to win. The computer says so. Crowd wasn't necessarily on their side. They definitely were hated. Yeah, but I also think that if you could find out what the who was going to win and you hadn't had the match yet, right? Would right. you attack the baby faces? Right, yeah. Yep. So I mean, you gotta go along with some stuff because it's just wrestling. Yes, yes. So the next match is basically to me a dream match of the probably the two most underrated wrestlers of all time, two of the big greatest workers of all time. Bobby Eaton defeats Brad Armstrong in 13 minutes in a really good match. So I love that that's just kind of thrown on the pay-per-view, maybe just for those people that love wrestling. But looking back, awesome match, and it's awesome to have those two on the pay-per-view wrestling each other. Two of the smoothest guys I was ever in the ring with. I wrestled Brad a lot in different territories, especially in the Pensacola one, where I had an angle with the whole family. Brad was so smooth. I mean, he reminded me a lot of Barry Windham, how smooth he was. Those two guys were probably the smoothest guys I've ever seen, besides Steamboat. You know what I mean? They yep. just, they almost made it look too easy. I agree. So smooth. Yeah. But that's awesome. That's on there. I mean, that's just like random as hell, and there's no real storyline to it, but it's just these two guys having a good match. I know people get on that for AEW, but sometimes it's a good thing. And what do you – yeah, sometimes it is. It, it gives the people like, whoa, I didn't expect that to be that good. But right. I, And the other thing is, what do you say about Bobby Eaton, one of the greatest performers of all times? Two Absolutely. you. You said it right. Two of the most underrated guys in the history of the business. They rule. Those guys are awesome. Now, the next match is weird. It's a Japanese woman's match. It's it's a Joshi match, if you will. This is kind of strange as well. Itsuki Yamazaki and Mami Katamura defeated Miki Honda and Miss A via pinfall. The match went about seven minutes. Um, I mean... I'm not really into the, the Japanese women's wrestling stuff, but I guess for the most part, though, this match was kind of given a, a good review and people did like it. But was there supposed to be some sort of all Japan women's relationship with you guys in 91? Why this random women's all Japan tag match? I'm going out on a limb here. I think it was because it had been kicked around to have a woman's division that had a lot of wrestling in it and a relationship with new japan's woman wrestling company would have been the easiest way to have that done do you again, think do you think it was again, popular though here that's like joshi no, no absolutely not but Again, it's what we said before. It's 91. They're throwing everything against the wall and to see what's next. It is interesting here in, in 2024 that uh, that's kind of been somewhat popular. Like there was a promotion here, Sakiban, that was in New York having shows. That was just Japanese Joshi shows. So it does seem like there's an audience for it nowadays. I think there's a cult following and everything right now with wrestling. You know, these deathmatch companies. Yeah. The all-girls yeah. company. You know, our friend Craig Massey uh, has a company that's all women company, you know. Uh, and they get Rampage Jackson as their commissioner. Yeah, yep. So uh, there's a lot to choose from. It's a buffet right now. For sure. That is for sure. Next up, uh, another pretty good match. A nice little uh, dream match. A lot shorter, though. Dustin Rhodes defeated Buddy Landell in six minutes and 30 seconds here. Another match not necessarily pay-per-view worthy, just because there's really no storyline going on with it or anything, but uh, two very good hands right there. Dustin Rhodes and Buddy Landell, the nature boy. Yeah, they should have definitely had a 
program before going into this. Uh, as years have gone by, I've appreciated Buddy Landell's work a lot more than I did at the time. It was like I was, back then I was saying, I wonder if a lot of people are saying, well, he's just being flair. No, he wasn't. He was being the reverse of flair. And, uh, you know, Buddy came close a bunch of times of really busting through. And different things held him back, you know, different situations. But Buddy and Dustin would have been a terrific match. And it was solid, I'm sure. Yeah. But it would have been a terrific if there was a storyline behind it. Because uh, Dustin can work his ass off. And it's funny, it's like a lot of these matches are kind of just thrown together. There's no real storyline in them. But for the most part, you got some like good matches. Like Dustin and Buddy was good. Bob Eaton and, and Brad Armstrong was good. Even the six-man opener was good. It's it's like in-ring on fire, creatively not so much. Yeah, and I think what you said was at the beginning of the broadcast, this was almost like a Saturday night show. You know, we're asking people to pay. What was it, thirty nine ninety nine at the time? Or yeah, back then it's about thirty bucks. Eventually, it goes. It would go up about five dollars every few months. But yeah, yep. yeah. So it was like I forget if it was Jimmy Cornette who said this. I was listening to YouTube, right? Uh where he said it might have been Conrad. I think it was Conrad that said this, that when they, people were trading tapes, did I ever tell you this, people trading tapes, they were seeing great matches. They were yep. all trading tapes to see great matches. They didn't care about the storylines because they weren't vested into going to the show, but they loved the great matches. Well, We've talked about some of these great matches now and legendary guys in the wrestling business and legendary workers that it didn't matter how great the match was. It didn't move the needle, right? But especially the Bobby and uh, uh, Brad. Yep, yep. You know, it was just a great match, but it didn't mean anything. It was and certainly... The reaction of the, when the Roman grabbed the Rock's wrist and said, "Acknowledge me." Right. Yep. Which was great, so, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So interesting. They go behind the scenes, and Missy Hyatt attempts to interview Stan Hansen backstage, and instead of doing that, he kind of chases her off, and she runs away scared. And he's kind of doing that, like, uh, you know, they got the cowboy, got the dip dripper from his mouth, that she runs away. Which I guess was a make fun because there was a, an announcer, Lisa Olson, in the Patriots locker room in, in 1990 yeah. earlier, a few months earlier. So kind of cheesy, but I guess you guys were copying that in, in a way. Yeah, I remember that now that you said it. Yeah. She was the first woman to go into a, a locker room in the NFL. Right. Yep. And they tried to, they ran her out, right? Yes. Uh, so I guess we were trying to copy it. Pretty uh, sophomoric. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was a big Missy Hyatt fan back then, though. Was, was a big fan. I don't know about you, but I was definitely a big fan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then we have the Young Pistols, which, of course, is Steve Armstrong and Tracy Smothers defeating the royal family of Rip Morgan and Jack Victory. The match went about 12 minutes. This was just maybe the... I guess you could say, quote unquote, maybe the worst match of the night, even though it really wasn't that bad, but just nothing, nothing great here um, as far as this match. Just, you know, it is what it is. It wasn't bad at all, but it wasn't great, especially compared to kind of what, what else is on the card. Yeah. And no story, right? So nope, there's no none. story. Nope. So it, it, your forecast gets to be clearer and clearer. It looks like a Saturday night. 
and we're asking people to pay thirty dollars. Yep. Do you like the Young Pistols better, or do you like them known as the Wild Eyed Southern Boys, with well, the, uh, the the Southern flag, if you will, attached to it? Well, you can't have the Southern flag. You know, it, you go nationwide, and uh, that boxed you in and made you really regional with the Confederate flag, and you know. It was just, uh, I, and I understand the bullshit about their uh, heritage, but they did break away and did, with all the crazy shit that Vince did in this era, did he have a Confederate flag on anybody? Right. So that's why we call them the, uh, Young, Young pistols. pistols, yeah. So then we have the next matchup. Let's see if Alexander York is right. Her man, Terrence Taylor, of course, with Alexander York, defeated the Z Man by pinfall in 11 minutes. Pretty good match here. Uh, obviously, Terrence Taylor, Terry Taylor, if you will, excellent hand. Z Man with the right opponent could, you know, he could be good at times. Did you almost expect more out of the Z Man, like a bigger future, or no? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like he he was supposed to be him and Pillman were supposed to be the next things, and Pillman kind of just, you know, basically surpassed him and never looked back. I mean, he he was a really good athlete, Tom Zink, but there was some kind of touch of paranoia with him. You know, uh, he was in a great spot spot in the tag match with Ricky Martel, right? Then he walked out because he found this discrepancy in the pay. Is that correct? What you heard? That's what I heard. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Ricky Martel had been around the world, had booked in different places, had been the AWA champion. And if they were paying him more, it was not because uh, they were trying to Browbeak think it was because they understood what Ricky Martel's influence was in that team and carried the team and was teaching Zink. Yep. He was making good money. But what I'm getting at is he always had that bit of paranoia and he had a sarcastic attitude. Definitely. So next up, for some reason, I obviously making fun of Elegante, but Paul Heyman is dressed up like a uh, mat matador and he's interviewing Elegante, kind of teasing him, goading him. And then, of course, Elegante then body slams him. And that's the end of that segment. But this is obviously when Heyman was was kind of just an announcer and a backstage um, announcer and a commentator. So he didn't have a huge role in 91 like he was going to have at the end of 91 and into 92. But do you like that? Do you think that, that that's, I don't know, a way to get L.A. Gante over because he can't really work or wrestle is have him beat up, a, you know, a heel announcer, if you will? Again, I go back to with throwing things against the wall. And we knew that wasn't going to work. What, what, what purpose was that? The giant slamming Paul, you know, it just yeah, it's kind of corny. Yeah, it was like this is probably the era where this was desperation. They didn't know we didn't know what we were doing. Next up, we have an awesome match, especially on paper, but it's just not long enough. But of course, they would have better matches in Japan. But it's Big Van Vader versus Stan Hansen ends in a double disqualification. Only goes about six minutes and 30 seconds. I wish it was longer, but it wasn't. Awesome to have these two kind of go at it. Why the like shorter match, non finish? Is this something because basically Japan wants to keep these guys both nice and clean? Well, one was New Japan, the other one was All Japan, right? Oh, that could be, you're right. That yeah, could be a play yeah, role in as well. Yep, yep. That's what it was. Vader, New Japan. Uh, New Japan? Yes. Hanson, yep. All Japan. Makes sense. Had, yep. He had just knocked Vader's eye out, right? Earlier. Yep. yep. So there shows you how willing they were 
to go protect their own companies. I thought this was cool, though. Even back then, it's like, wow, these two beasts, who the hell is going to win? You know what I mean? Like these two animals going at it. Pretty evenly matched. Yeah, and I think that the idea was to only give them six minutes was let's make sure they don't have enough time that something turns sideways. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You don't read uh, Fade to get his eye knocked out again. Right. They um, they definitely were two, two of the best, like uh, you could say big men, if you will. But, I mean, the two of the best even at that time was great. I just wish the match was longer because it was awesome for what it was. The six minutes that it was was awesome. Yeah, but the, what I'm getting at is the business behind the business. Yes, yep. If we gave them 15 minutes and somewhere after the six-minute mark, someone got hurt and we're trying to placate both companies, Yep. they would have said, why did you let them go more than six or seven minutes? Yep, true. Next up, we have Lex Luger defending his United States Championship against Dan Spivey. Lex Luger defeated Spivey in 13 minutes to retain the title. Surprisingly, maybe to some, but a very good match between Luger and Spivey. What happens afterwards may be the best part. Nikita Koloff, who supposedly retired at this point, comes out with Grizzly Smith, and they're handing a new United States Championship, a new belt for Luger, only to have Nikita nail Luger from behind and basically unretire and turn heel and beat up Luger and beat him up with, with the new belt. Good aftermath. Yeah. Uh, now Nikita has a crew cut, right? Uh, he's he's bald now, again. Okay. He, ha he did have a crew cut when he yeah. left originally, though. Yes, yeah. I know you mean. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, he Nikita had been a big draw for the Crockett's. Why not bring him in again to th try anything to get some traction? Yep. And it just, it felt like maybe a bit of revenge from Nikita, just playing off the old storyline where basically, if you look at it, Luger's a heel in 87. He beat Nikita. For the for the U.S. title, Nikita had the longest title run up to the point, basically 330 days as champion. Luger defeats him, so it's it's kind of a cool little homage or little throwback if you think about it, because he's attacking him, he's giving him the new belt. Well, why is he doing that? Because he beat him years earlier, saying that he should have never lost to him to begin with. So it does make sense storyline wise, even going back a few years. Yeah, yeah, it does make sense. That was uh... Nikita was bitter. Yeah, and that was one of the few things that had a bit of a storyline up until now. Yep. Next up, we have the fabulous Freebirds, Michael Hayes and Jimmy Jam Garvin with Big Daddy Dink and Diamond Dallas Page defeating Doom, who, of course, is Ron Simmons and Butch Reed with Teddy Long. Um, and that was actually a tag match for the WCW Tag Team Championship. What do you think about the fabulous Freebirds going over Doom? Uh, one of the greatest ensemble cast of all times. So, I mean, Michael was the talker, the flamboyant one. Buddy was very instrumental in that group. He was the guy that's put in the time and got bounced around. And then you had Terry Gordy, the enforcer type guy, the bull of the woods. It was well constructed. And they all were pieced together so well that you could interchange them and not lose a step. Here you have Jimmy Jam Garvin. Do you like Jimmy Jam in the Freebirds with Big Daddy Dink and DDP? Yeah, I did like uh, Jimmy in there. He was a. This is when Terry was going to Japan, right? And he's gone, so there is no more really Gordy, and right. they're not. You know, he's definitely he's he's Japan all the way through. 
Right. And then later on, he came back for a while, made shots with Dr. Death. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Jimmy was the perfect guy to fill in. So, do you like, so this is the interesting thing here. Do you like the fact that they win the tag team titles here, meaning the Freebirds win, they beat Doom, they're, they're the new tag team champions. But technically speaking, the week before, they lost these titles to the Steiner brothers at a TV taping, which would be aired after this. Does that confuse you as a booker? It's like, okay, we're going to pretend they're champions here. They're going to lose to the Steiner brothers, but this won't air until after the pay-per-view. A lot of things could happen, injuries and, and different stuff. It's kind of risky. Yeah, it's risky, but it's been done since probably TV's been in vogue. You know, since been able to tape and show it back that it didn't was alive. Do you know what I mean? Yep. So do I? Do you like it? No, but there are things that force you to do it. I never liked it because you're exposing it. You know, and with Jannetty and Shawn Michaels. That happened, and then something happened where they couldn't show that they're winning the title. They never actually won the title, right? Mm. Well, here on the pay-per-view, but they never really wanted to lose it. Yeah, yep. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, it was, yep. Won, yeah. yep. It was the same situation, but then one of them got hurt, I believe. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, it's just interesting. It's like, wow, free birds are the champs, but technically speaking, they're the champs for negative one week. You know what I mean? Because they, yeah. they already lost it a week ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that match was pretty good for what it was. Again, another short match, only went about seven minutes. And obviously, yeah, Big Daddy Dink and uh, DDP there are, 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 are getting involved. DDP would be destined not to be a manager, as we've talked about on this show many, many times. Yeah. And, uh, I don't ever hear, I shouldn't say ever, but it's very rare in this day and age I hear anything about Humperdinck. Yeah, right? But you should. Yeah, he was very, very good being a manager. Yep. Very strange look, you know what I mean? Could get heat, too. Yep. Uh, he could get heat. He was very, very good. Very... Uh, he went up to New York and was doing well, and something happened there, and then he just stuck out of the business and never went back. Right. Big Daddy Dink, weird name, but uh, <laughs> but but kind of funny looking at it, looking at it. Now, as far as the main event of the evening, the Four Horse and Ric Flair, Barry Windham, Sid Vicious, and the replacing Arn Anderson was, of course, the Cruncher, Larry Zbysko, defeated Sting, Brian Pillman, and the Steiner Brothers, Rick and Scott, in 22 minutes in an awesome, awesome War Games match. If you haven't seen it, go out of your way to see it. It is an awesome match, a five-star match, if you will. The finish came when it seemed like Sid legitimately hits Pillman's head on the top of the cage with the power bomb, and then just destroys him with the power bomb. Looked like he may have hurt his neck pretty bad uh, on that finish. Unable to continue, Elegante comes to the ring and he surrenders on Brian Pillman's behalf. So, what? First of all, what, what did you think about the match? And second of all, was that the original finish? Um, I believe it was. I mean, I I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, I thought the match was excellent. And I I don't think they would have sent Elegante down if someone was really hurt. You know what I mean? Mm. He did kill him with that power bomb for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, knocked the wind out of him for sure. Do you think that the horsemen were definitely were always supposed to win the match no matter what? That's, that was the booking? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great match. I mean, if, if people if people haven't seen it, you probably should. War Games is usually a home run match. It's usually an awesome match, but this was great. You had eight pretty damn good workers here. You had a lot of action, just I mean, just killing each other. It just felt like there was some real animosity, obviously, with with Sting and the Horsemen. So really good stuff. And this was almost the only match that really kind of screamed pay per view, if you will, besides Vader and Hanson. But this scream, like why you should order the pay per view, it's almost a on paper, like a one match show, even though all the other matches turned out to be pretty good, right? Doesn't it feel a little bit like a one man show when you're looking at the pay per view on paper? Well, you started the 
show today by saying it was a Saturday night show. Yeah. It was. Yeah, you're absolutely right. With the two matches you picked out, that was the only ones that had any, any kind of a storyline with us. And any sort of like marquee thing. I mean, obviously the war games was what they were promoting and that's the whole right. pay-per-view, but it didn't seem like the rest of the pay-per-view had many storylines. It didn't support the main event. The undercard did not support the main event. It wasn't because of the talent. It was because of creativity, the creative office, yeah. not giving enough time and storylines to the rest of the matches. Yep. And believe it or not, this pay-per-view got basically rave reviews. Like I mentioned, all the matches were really good. This pay-per-view got rave reviews from you know people watching it, critics alike. They just absolutely uh, loved it just for the fact that every match was good and you had an awesome main event with War Games. So it would, did get rave reviews, even though creative stunk for it. Well, again, they were looking at good matches, right? Yes, 100%. Well, so that maybe solidifies my point where people, uh, the hardcore fan are buying it because they're seeing good matches where the common wrestling fan doesn't see any storyline in it. There's no... Roman Reigns grabbing the rock's wrist and saying, acknowledge me. Yes. Yep. Another interesting note, though, not that Phoenix is a bad market. I mean, it's a pretty good market, but WWF tried to run a show the day before you guys did in the same market. It drew 48,000 fans. Um, well, basically, between, they said between 48 and 6,000. So somewhere in between there is what, what the, the draw was. You guys drew 6,800 and um, basically had around the same gate as far as money concerns were and, and buy, uh, buys wise as far as buying tickets. But it seemed like they were trying to hurt you guys by running that market the day before, but it didn't hurt at all. Uh, yeah, it was one of those deals where how often have we been in the Phoenix market? Not much. That's really, that's, that's like WWF territory, yeah. Yeah, and that's what I'm getting at is I think we're brand new and people are coming out to check us out. Yep. And, yeah. hey, it's kind of, not that they had a big show, there was a house show, but you guys outdrew WWF in 91, so not too shabby. No, no. And this show, if you look at, like, critics, what critics say, they love this show. And the only shows they really liked more were Clash of Champions 9, which is Flyer Funk and the I Quit match, and Wrestle War 89, which is Flyer Steamboat. So the critics that love their wrestling, if you will, they right. loved this show, Wrestle War 91. So I don't know. I, I give it a thumbs up just because I, I just loved um, the War Games so much, and the other matches were good. And you sold me with Vader and Hanson and Eaton and um, Brad Armstrong. Yeah. Yeah. I give it a thumbs up also. It was a good pay-per-view to build off of. You, It wasn't a disaster uh, mechanically, which was a plus. You could have, yep. should have been able to build off of that. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Let's hit the plugs. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Kevin, what do you got going on in this crazy world? Uh, this Saturday, I'll be in Chillicothe, Ohio, for the uh, Tommy and his son, Fulton. Yep. Uh, it's going to be a big, huge show, a convention, and then the wrestling afterwards. So come out and see me. Nice. All right. Thank you, everybody out there, for listening. See you right back here next time. Have a good one, folks.